Hello everyone. A very good morning, good afternoon or good evening to you as the case may be. I'm Karthik Raghunathan from the Webex intelligence team at Cisco. And today I'll be talking about some common challenges that developers face when building voice assistants using third party speech recognition services and how we can overcome those challenges in our natural language understanding systems. But first, let me start with a quick intro about myself and my team. I'm the director of machine learning for Webex Intelligence, which is the team responsible for building machine learning driven intelligent experiences across all of Cisco's collaboration products. Most of my team joined Cisco via the acquisition of our conversational AI startup MindMelt back in 2017. Prior to our acquisition, MindMelt used to power conversational interfaces for several companies in the food, retail, and media industry. And now as a part of Cisco, we are bringing that same technology to Cisco's products. The most popular among them is Webex Assistant, which is a collaboration focused enterprise voice assistant for the meeting room. You can use Webex Assistant to control your video conferencing devices, book conference rooms, join online meetings, call people in your company directory and so on. Webex Assistant is built on top of the MindMelt conversational AI platform. This is a platform that we originally developed when we were a startup and are now continuing to maintain and improve upon at Cisco. Just last year, we open sourced the MindMelt platform. So now it's being used not only by several teams within Cisco, but also by the wider developer community. We've seen MindMelt being used for both text-based chatbots and for voice assistants, but today I'll be focusing mainly on the latter. Over the past few years, it's been really encouraging to see that the general population is becoming more and more comfortable with using voice interfaces. Uh, multiple sources now report that at least a third of the US population has a smart speaker and uses voice assistants on a fairly regular basis. And these numbers are only expected to grow in the post COVID world as uh, users prefer using touch-free touch interfaces as much as possible. While all of that is great news, anyone who has attempted to build one of these systems knows that it's no easy feat. Um, now, there's clearly a lot of exciting areas of active research in the academia focusing on more complex and deeper neural net architectures for problems like language processing, language generation, and dialogue state tracking. But uh, today I'm not going to be talking about any of those cutting edge research problems because I believe that all of that great work can still get undermined by the simple fact that voice assistants often suffer from bad hearing. I'm sure a lot of us have been in the situation where even a fairly simple voice command has been misunderstood simply because your assistant did not clearly hear, uh, clearly hear you. This actually ends up being the Achilles heel for most voice assistants today. And if you want to make a significant improvement in user experience, focusing your efforts here will give you the most bang for your buck. What this means in more technical terms is that the accuracy of your ASR, that is automatic speech recognition, has a huge impact on the overall quality of your voice assistant. Now, this is because in all voice assistants, ASR is the first step in the pipeline, and, and therefore any errors that are introduced at this stage simply cascade to the downstream components and cause them to make errors as well. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen headlines like these in the past few years and may think that speech recognition is an already solved technology. Unfortunately, the reality is quite different. What we've observed in our real world applications is that the word error rate, which is the metric by which ASR quality is measured, can be far higher than the sub 5% numbers that are often reported on well studied academic data sets. Um, off the shelf ASR, ASR services like the ones from Google, Microsoft, or Amazon often make a lot of mistakes on proper nouns and domain specific terminology. And uh, these errors are only exacerbated in the real world when having to deal with users with diverse accents or non-ideal acoustic environments. 
As you can imagine, any of these errors will cause your assistant to take an unsatisfactory action because the main entity of interest has been lost in the ASR output. So clearly, we need to come up with some techniques to overcome these mistakes. But before we discuss the potential solutions, I wanted to establish a couple of things before moving forward. First, we'll assume that the ASR we are using is an off-the-shelf black box system that we can't really modify and have to use as is. This is a reasonable assumption to make because most cloud-based ASR service providers today uh, provide very little room for customization. However, we'll at least assume that the ASR can provide to us uh, not just its most confident transcript, but a ranked list of alternate hypotheses. Second, uh, when talking about the NLU or NLP stack for a voice assistant, different implementations may use different steps as part of the full pipeline. But today, we'll be restricting our discussion to the three main steps, which are important for any kind of voice assistant. And these are intent classification, entity recognition, and entity resolution. So with that in mind, let's take a look at a few things we've tried out in order to make our NLU more resilient to ASR errors. The first thing we tried out is a technique called NBEST rescoring or NBEST re-ranking. Here, we use some application-specific domain knowledge to bias and possibly correct the ASR output. So without going into too much detail about how modern ASRs work, at a conceptual level, it's helpful to think of an ASR as consisting of three separate stages. We first extract some useful audio features from the input speed signal. Uh, we then use an acoustic model to map those extracted features into phonemes or distinct sounds that exist in the language. And finally, use a language model to transform that sequence of sounds into a sequence of words, thereby forming the full sentence. Like other probabilistic systems, ASRs are capable of outputting not just their best case, but an NBEST list of uh, ranked alternate hypotheses. The key thing to note here is that the language model in an off-the-shelf ASR system is a generic domain agnostic model that may work well for web searches or a generic dictation task, but may not be best suited for recognizing the kind of language users might use when talking to your assistant. So while we can't really modify the language model within a black box ASR system, we can create our own separate domain-aware language model to help us pick the best candidate from among the ASR hypotheses. What we do is take the training data that we already have for training our intent and uh, entity classification models within the NLU pipeline and use that training data with uh, open source language modeling toolkit to build our in-domain language model. This trained in-domain language model can then be used to provide a probability score for any arbitrary sequence of words. So we can use it to rescore and re-rank this NBEST list of hypotheses from the ASR. And we can then choose the new top candidate post the re-ranking for further downstream processing by our NLU models. In this example, you can see that the ASR's original top pick was a different one. And that's presumably because Trying marijuana may be a fairly popular engram on the web. And EMR, which stands for electronic medical record, is a more popular word in general than PMR, which is personal meeting room and only makes sense in the context of online meetings. But our in-domain language model should be able to assign fairly high probabilities to words like join, PMR, and possibly even Maria Joanna, if uh, that name was present in our training data. So that's how it's able to pick the right candidate. The advantage of this technique is that it's not targeted at any one specific downstream NLU task, but pretty much the entire NLU pipeline can benefit from having to deal with a much cleaner, yeah, much cleaner input. The disadvantage is that this does introduce one other model, uh, yet another model to your overall pipeline that you now need to optimize and maintain in production. Uh, there may also be a small latency cost associated with uh, introducing this additional processing step between your ASR and your NLU. And even assuming that you got all of those logistics right, 
There is still this limitation that this technique cannot make any novel corrections. It can only choose from among the various options given to it by the ASR. So that means that there is a good chance that you would, you'd still need some more additional robustness mechanisms further down the pipeline. The second technique is a fairly simple one. NLU models are usually trained only using, uh, by only using clean data, by which I mean query examples without any errors. So the idea behind this technique is to spice up our labeled data sets with some noise so that the training data more closely resembles what the NLU models will encounter at runtime. The way we do this is we augment our training data sets with examples of queries with commonly observed ASR errors. So for instance, if we observe in our live production logs that join the meeting is often mistranscribed as shine the meeting, or if we see that the ASR often, often misrecognizes start the meeting as shark the meeting, we add these erroneous queries to our intent classification training data set as well. You can, you can follow a similar approach with your entity recognition models too. So you could add mistranscriptions like cool Tim Turtle or video call with Dennis Toy to your intent recogni entity recognition uh, training data sets. This approach, if executed correctly, works out really well in practice and can greatly improve the real world accuracies of your intent classification and entity recognition models. Uh, you, of course, need to make sure that you don't go overboard with this approach. Uh, if you are to if you are to add in every possible way in which an ESR can mistranscribe your queries, that will more likely confuse your model more than it would help it. So what we do is only add examples of uh, uh, mistranscribed queries that are fairly common in our user logs. Uh, we also make sure that we only add near misses, so transcriptions that are slightly off. And we avoid adding mistranscriptions that are being garbled beyond recognition. Uh, one other thing that you need to ensure as part of this approach is that uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't introduce any conflicting evidence uh, for your NLU models. For example, start the meeting may sometimes get misrecognized as stop the meeting. But adding stop the meeting as an example for the joint meeting intent uh, would not be good because that would then introduce a confusion between the joint meeting intent and the end meeting intent, which is where that example should rightfully belong. So with this approach, uh, we were mainly focused on improving the accuracy for the intent classification and entity recognition models. But now let's turn our focus to entity resolution. Entity resolution or entity linking is the task of mapping a mapping a detected entity uh, in, in the user input, like Cheryl, to a canonical concrete entity in your knowledge base, like Cheryl Lee. It's this resolution step that allows us to correctly fulfill the user's intent because, for example, in this case, we now know the right person to initiate this video call with. Entity resolution is often modeled as an information retrieval problem. So for instance, you can use a full text full text search engine like Elasticsearch to index all of the canonical entities that are relevant to your application and create a knowledge base. And then at runtime, you can execute a search query against this knowledge base using the, uh, using the extracted entity text and get back a ranked list of matching results. To improve this search accuracy and thereby the entity resolution accuracy, there are several different features we can experiment with. We can encourage partial or fuzzy matching by using features such as normalized tokens, character engrams, word engrams, and edge engrams. We can also do some simple semantic matching by using a mapping of domain-specific entity synonyms or entity aliases. Textual similarity features like these are helpful for all kinds of conversational assistance, regardless of the input modality. But next, we'll look at a few additional features that are specifically useful for making entity resolution more robust to ASR errors. The first thing we introduce are phonetic similarity features, because text similarity by itself isn't enough for dealing with ASR errors. For example, Corin Precocious is textually pretty different, different from Kiran Precocious, but they do sound similar, so they should be fairly close in the phonetic space. One way, to, one way to encode text into, phonetic, into a phonetic representation 
is by using the double metaphone algorithm. This is a rule-based algorithm that can map a given word into a phonetic code such that similar words have similar phonetic encoder, similar sounding words have similar phonetic encodings. A more recent approach is to use a machine learned grapheme to phoneme model, which can transform a given piece of text into a sequence of phonemes. Uh, again, uh, similar sounding words will have a similar uh, will have similar phonetic sequences, and the detailed representation here also makes it easier to compute uh, compute this phonetic similarity on a more granular level. In our experiments, we found that these two techniques often provide complementary information. So we ended up using phonetic features from uh, both of these techniques to improve our search algorithm. The next technique is targeted at improving the overall search recall. And this works by leveraging the entire NBEST list of hypotheses rather than only dealing with the top transcript. So we run entity recognition on all of the NBEST hypotheses and then use the uh, use all of the extracted NBEST entity spans in our search query against the knowledge base. In some cases, you may find that the correct entity is even present a little deeper in the ASR NBEST list, like in this example where Sheetal was, a, was the ASR's third best guess. Even when that's not the case, pooling, uh, pooling text and phonetic features across the NBEST list has this effect of upweighting features which have consistent evidence across the NBEST list and downweighting outliers, thereby resulting in a better overall match. The last thing we'll talk about is using user-based personalization to improve the precision of our search. Uh, the rationale here is that you can improve entity resolution accuracy by using some prior knowledge or prior information about a user, such as the kind of entities that a particular user is more likely to talk about. Uh, these personalization features are highly application specific and depend on the specific use case at hand. For example, in WebEx Assistant, a common use case for us is being able to call people, uh, call people in the company directory. So what we do is compute a familiarity score for every user. For every user, we have a familiarity score between that user and every other employee in the company. This familiarity score can take into account factors like uh, how close or how far are two different people in the company's organization hierarchy, and how frequently do they interact with each other via calls or online meetings and so on. Uh, we can then uh, use the rationale that people are more, more likely to call others who they are more familiar with and use this as an additional ranking factor or an additional score that we can use during ranking to disambiguate between similar sounding names in the ASR hypotheses and pick the right one. This was just one example. But you can similarly envision different kinds of uh, personalization features depending on the use case at hand. I learned today by reiterating that any developer who is building a voice assistant should give some serious thought to making their NLU models more robust to ASR errors. This can often be the difference between an unusable product and, and a product that has good user experience. Uh, pretty much all the robustness features and techniques we talked about today are available in the MindMill platform in some form or the other. The only feature we don't have a native support for is being able to train in-domain language models and using them for NBEST rescoring. But this is still something that developers can try out on their own. And if they find, find it useful, they can use it as a pre-processing step before calling the MindMill NLU pipeline. One of our current ongoing explorations that is showing some promise is being able to generate phonetic embeddings for words and then using a vector similarity based phonetic search approach, uh, which, is, uh, which, which is proving out to be more efficient and accurate than our elastic search based methods that we use today. Uh, this technique will hopefully be coming to the platform soon. To learn more, please check out our website, our GitHub repo, and our papers from EMNLP that cover some of the things I talked about today in a lot more detail. Thank you.